AUS Silver Jubilee Podcast, presented by the MCM Department and the College of Arts and Sciences. Silver Jubilee Podcast. Hello and welcome. Joining me today is Fatma Schweiter, an AOS alumna and the founder of Arc Coffee in Sharjah. She graduated in 2012 with a bachelor's degree in mass communication and a minor in environmental policy. Thank you for being here, Fatma. Tell us, what does it feel like to be back on campus today? Exciting every morning, that's what I should say. <laughs> it was like that, it still is. The same excitement is there, same laziness is there as well. So yeah, <laughs> that felt exactly the same. It feels different though, walking around. A lot of things changed to a certain extent. It was nice to see familiar faces, familiar corners. I was actually looking for my friends, the ghosts of them, you know, like how we walked in and we we're all there, you know, like we're just sitting there waiting for class. This was quite nostalgic. It felt nice. But, you know, new faces, new lives, new people and new experiences, more technology, I should say. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us about your journey after graduation? Started classic, looking for a job, found a job, worked for a while, uh, fell into the pressure of traveling, I, the job was in Dubai, and then into the family pressure of it's too far, find somewhere closer. And so I did. The Somewhere Closer had a lot of opportunities for me to grow. I was like, you know, I, I started to follow the routes and yet again the classic, go for my master's. And just right there in the middle of my master's degree, there was a change of mind and heart. It happened through research. It happened through experience, the changes. An incident, something just happened. And it just made me flip and like diverted my whole career to somewhere else and something else. The details of it, I wouldn't say complicated, but it's more of a chained up story. It started off with me visiting for a certain project that I was working on. Me visiting sites of uh, waste management facilities. I was looking at the uh, amount of waste that was not being recycled, and I was looking at the amount of food that was in the waste. And this is the hiccup of recycling food. As long as there is food in the waste, it's very hard to recycle or use, then again, for anything, because you have a lot of organisms growing in the waste, and it's hard to manage then to always end up in the landfill, and that's it. And it was a part of what I studied environmental policies and I've always had a focus on CSR in, in my work although I was working in exhibitions and exhibition management at that point and this was for a certain a visit for a certain exhibition just got me wondering on why would we have so much food this was my question I immediately went into a troubleshoot why can't we use all that waste and then there was food and then there was um, okay fine we get that it's mixed we can segregate there are so many ways to segregate. There are like water chambers, magnetic chambers. There are places where you can remove the wood and then you'll remove the scraps and the scraps of plastic and paper. And, but the food is a mess and it's, it's a hazard too. Like, I mean, I can't think of what's worse, a sharp object in waste in which the person who's segregating would be exposed to or an explosion of mold that's coming out of food waste. And most of these processes now are robotic, like you don't have people doing it anymore. But even then, their food is a living thing, just keeps on evolving and changing and being something else. So instead of being something else where it should be, which in an ideal scenario, compost, or in a better scenario, eaten, not wasted, it's just being dumped. I just kept on wondering, researching. Then again, we're built on, we were, the mechanism of our brain changed coming here to AUS. What do you mean by that? When I was curious back then, when I was in school or say just normally, when I was curious, I would just, we didn't have Google, we had Ask Jeeves back then. So I would just, you know, check Ask Jeeves or go to the library or, I mean, I won't go into depth. But then coming here, the being part of a certain method of thinking, curiosity was diverted into research, and we had a lot of resources and a lot of answers, a lot of statistics, a lot of exposure. So found a lot of answers from the other countries that experienced this, other people that have experienced this, articles, research papers. It was just mismanagement of food in restaurants and households. And what did you do with that information? I shared it with the right people, and I've asked them if there was anything. So there was that. There was a target towards even housemaids to educate them to properly segregate food scraps away from waste and how to store hygiene of storing food and all of these things. But only so much was done. And at the end of the day, it's a culture. I mean, there are a lot of areas that do properly treat food and know how to not waste. 
but then this depends on their resources. The larger the resource, the more you people tend to waste. And our resources here, yani, alhamdulillah, thank God, are quite available. So people fall into the luxury of not properly treating food. I thought, okay, households, bit of a problem. Culture, you know, where they're used to it. But why not restaurants? And then it hit me, environmental policies, it's a policy. If it's a policy, then there's a fine. Or if it's a policy, then there's a restriction. So why not restaurants? They're huge. They're all over the place. UAE has a huge F&B industry. I was never part of it, not until now. So I started to ask around, even the real estate projects that my dad was involved in. I went into the sites, I was asking, shopping malls here and there, what happens to the waste? Apparently it has to all be wasted for hygiene reasons. Like nothing is allowed to be given out if it passed through the kitchen. If it's still clean and no one touched it, yes, it's given to charities, or what we have here is Hafz al or Charity Association is as a food bank. In a way or another, it shouldn't be a PR stunt to be an eco-friendly restaurant or to be a zero-waste restaurant because a lot of people do it for publicity or to gain a label like they're eco-friendly just to make, you know, the vegans and the, the tree huggers come into the restaurant so they can develop a certain vibe of people or a certain clientele. And I thought that's not the right thing. Like, it should be just only natural. What made you want to be a restaurant owner? To make that to see if this can actually naturally be that. And I had a support uh, from the Sharjah Business Women Council. Like I was discussing it as idea. And this was just an open door. But then yet, I was still doing my master's for the job that I was in to get a promotion and to just follow that career path, the corporate career path. And it just happened that one of the exhibitions that I was managing the marketing at is the kitchen exhibition. And I had a talk with the lady that had an institute in UAE, and it was next door to where I was doing my master's. And she was like, why don't you pass by? And I did pass by. And only if I could pass the credits, but I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I did. I just stopped my master's program, and I went into backwards into a diploma program and to culinary arts. And it took a year. It was a very interesting year. I'm getting answers. True, I put myself into a lot of experiences just to find answers. Not only the UAE, like we travel to Turkey quite often and the, the, the FMB scene there is, is insane and quite different from the UAE. And I had a whole set of different answers there and uh, different experiences. This was in 2018. 2015 this idea started. And now we're in 2023 and how does it feel like to be a restaurant owner? It's a whole different social experience. I have no words to describe it. I feel new to a lot of people, even family members, even friends. Hosting them as host is different. I'm experiencing them not as family members anymore. As And this is where I really, truly understood what I was looking for, the answers that I wanted. All what I put myself through in three years summed up in a day, just in the opening day of seeing people the way a restaurant owner would see them. How did you see them? Well, I can't really explain it properly because nothing went by the book. I opened after COVID. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been you. Nothing really went by the book. There were a lot of things that were expected in which I've studied and, you know, the etiquette of the scene of a restaurant, the front of house. Even the back of house was different. Not what we've expected. I did my diploma and I did my all the other uh, courses that I took later, the uh, master classes. I did them before COVID. I experienced them as a student and as an employee because I was training. So uh, I did not experience them as restaurant owner. You had to figure things out from the beginning. We had to figure people out. A restaurant is a house. It's an open house. It's a public space. It's where you go away from home to eat and which you want to feel like home. So if at home you were in lockdown, you were locked in and you were sanitizing even the lettuce, then you come to a restaurant right after lockdown. I opened the day after lockdown. There was no opening. I didn't know if I could even do an event. There was nothing. And it was just like a post at 8 p.m. open tomorrow at 11 a.m. You know, that's it. Surprisingly, people filled up the place, alhamdulillah. We had people who didn't want to touch anything. They just wanted to sit and then slowly start to touch things like the table and maybe first sanitize it. And then they went to everything in takeaway. And I'm like, what happened to my zero waste policy? <laughs> like everything is takeaways now, you know? The struggle was to make them accept a wooden fork and spoon. And they don't want the metal. They don't want anything that someone ever touched. Starting off with the idea of having a zero waste. And then you have everything that is in takeaways. And you're trying to avoid as much as disposables as 
as possible. Sanitizers and chemicals all over the place. We had the huge lot of disposables happening. Even when receiving the goods, it was a lot of packaging. I mean, I felt like I called the devil upon myself by saying I want zero waste because we had tons of packagings, tons. Eventually that thought stopped. We stopped receiving so many packaged items and we stopped having the municipality checking up on us every now and then if we're doing the extreme of sanitization or not. Why did you decide to call it Arc Coffee? Arc, we go back in time and I was five or six or seven or eight or nine up until today. If you give me a pencil and paper and a bunch of crayons, the first thing that I will draw is Noah's Ark. I don't know, it's just stuck in my head as a child. The whole story, I mean, as a child, it was extremely exciting to me. I mean, I grew up thinking of everything this way. There always has to be this one whole full solution. So there has to be an arc to everything that you're going through. Even the way I developed the idea of arc, like I, I was looking for an escape boat for the situation that I saw as food waste, a solution how to get out of this. And the only thing that I did is I applied it on myself. Like he had to, he applied it on himself and his family and he built the boat and it worked. And having a zero waste restaurant without having to stress over marketing media and all of these things and having to push the green envelope, as they say, it can oh, happen naturally without having to bother about everything. Even your food scraps can end up being a pickle in which you can throw in a blender with Japanese mayo and call it something fancy and sell it for a thousand dirhams as you have like, you know, infused God knows all of these lines that they use, you know. What are some of your fondest memories of AOS? It was really your friends that shape your experience, the people that are with you, your professors, they're your parents here and your friends are your siblings. It's a whole different experience. You walk out of home to go into another one. It's like having two houses. My family is a bit conservative, so my dad was like, it's a mixed university, there are boys and girls. And, and there was that thought of, it's not proper at first. But the moment I walked into campus and I got to know everyone, and it felt exactly like walking into a house. And I would go home, talk to them about home, <laughs> and I would come here and talk to them about there. And then my dad was like, I was worried about putting you into a whole different sphere of people. And now I think like, you know, I just made the family bigger. I mean, even to my dad, every single professor was one of his brothers eventually. You know, like they ended up knowing each other. They ended up having to ask about each other every now and then. Though we're scattered, like we graduated 10 years ago, we scattered all over the place. But it still feels like I would just come home and, Mom, do you know that he's there or she's there and she did this and did that? And I'm like, really? What happened? It's, it's different. It's not like we were students. It was never like we were students. We were a family here. And the student experience, as I told you, it shaped our minds to what we thought was academia. And that we came here and it was a shock. We hit the ground running and we ran. Well, because of that, were you involved in clubs? Of course. Now, this was the student experience. And then there is the extracurricular. And it was with those who are not with me in class. And this put us in a whole other circle. Not the MassCom family, not the family that I have here. But then there is other family that you get to choose. Now, them, I didn't get to choose. <laughs> We didn't choose each other. We were just there, you know, we were put together. And then there's the family that you get to choose, which are the clubs. My involvement was with a lot of clubs to start with, the Emirati Cultural Club. And this was through friends that were personal contacts, even before university. The activities started as the National Day and things like that. I got to know more people that are not from my college. We did a lot of uh, activities that made us feel like, you know, the club felt like a company. So we were doing things like finding sponsors, doing activity, applying what we studied on that. So it was a form of internship to me, like I was applying MassCom. The events were interesting because a lot of people come in and they would be surprised that we actually have time to do these events. <laughs> like they think that we're like 24 seven nerds, but no, 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 we're doing the whole thing here. To end with, how do you think AUS helped you become the person you are today? It taught me one thing, is that you're not limited to be whatever it is that you choose you are. There's no limit to what you think you want to be now. Back then, I wanted to be a PR. And I did not know that this is a huge door that opens a ton of other doors that you might not know it. where will you end up or what will you do. As long as you got the formula to apply, the right formula that they gave us to apply. And this is the way that I was shaped. Quite, can't say malleable, like it's not that we fit everywhere, but we know exactly the right place that we can fit in and exactly the right thing we need to do in the right situation. And more or less, like there is no limit to what your brain can do because we were exactly and not metaphorically 
by the diction, pushed to the limits of our mind to produce whatever it is that we were asked to. And we used to do much better than that. We used to fall into challenges as students and we were put in them, test our abilities. And it's not that we were expected to do less or to do more. We were expected to do exactly what we were asked to. But the way we were intrigued and encouraged and blast our minds into stars, into the universe, to just perform a very simple assignment or task made us what we are today, made us feel like we don't have a limit to what we can do as long as we have the right resource and we have the right people supporting us. And this is what we had. And hopefully this is what we will always have and what you guys will always have too. Inshallah. Thank you so much for joining me today, Fatma. It's been a pleasure having you here. What a great chat. Wish you all the best. Thank you so much. (laughs) (laughs) And great convo. (laughs) AUS Silver Jubilee Podcast, presented by the MCM Department and the College of Arts and Sciences. Silver Jubilee Podcast.